The horror here isn't that an army general was so disrespectful. The horror is that everything he said was absolutely correct. Just think, had any one of these serious personal deficiencies been found in a candidate for high office who is not connected to the conspiracy, the media would have had a field day. They would have made a huge story out of it and used it to derail any challenge to the conspiracy's power. But as bad as these character flaws are, they are minor compared to the agenda Mr. Clinton will carry out at the behest of his equally corrupt conspiratorial bosses. We mentioned the Council on Foreign Relations. Every once in a while, you see a piece in the paper and you shake your head and, and you say, why golly, some other people are beginning to say the same thing. Here's an article from the Washington Post of Saturday, October 30, 1993, Richard Harwood. And he's talking about this private organization, this Council on Foreign Relations, begun in 1921 by a, a world government promoter named Edward Mandel House, who worked for President Wilson and who wrote a book calling for socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. What did Mr. Harwood say? He said... The Council on Foreign Relations is a ruling establishment in the United States. He said the president is a member, so is his secretary of state, the deputy secretary of state, all five of the undersecretaries, several of the assistant secretaries, and the department's legal advisor. The president's national security advisor and his deputy are members. The director of the central intelligence, like all previous directors, and the chairman of the foreign intelligence advisory board are members. The Secretary of Defense, three undersecretaries, and at least four assistant secretaries are members. The secretaries of the Departments of Housing and Urban Development, Interior, Health and Human Services, and the Chief White House Public Relations man, David Gergen, are members, along with the Speaker of the House, Mr. Foley, and the Majority Leader of the Senate, Senator Mitchell. Right? In the Washington Post. He went on to talk about the fact that the Washington Post could claim that the editorial page editor, deputy editorial page editor, executive editor, managing editor, foreign editor, national affairs editor, business and financial editor, and various writers, as well as Catherine Graham, the paper's principal owner, are also members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And it was in their own paper. We didn't make it up. It's there. Happily, some of these people are also saying it. He went on and he talked about the executive editor, edit, managing editor, foreign editor of the New York Times are also members, along with executives of such large newspapers as the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the weekly news magazines, network television executives, and celebrities. Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, Jim Lehrer, and various columnists, among them Krauthammer, Buckley, Will, Hoagland, and I could name even more than he named. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Council on Foreign Relations is a pretty important organization. And about 20 years ago, a former Judge Advocate General of the United States Navy, Admiral Chester Ward, wrote in a book that he co-authored about the subversive nature of the Council on Foreign Relations that he had been a member of for about 20 years. And he confirmed from the inside what we can see from the outside and what this reporter for the Washington Post finally found out himself. The Council on Foreign Relations, 3,000 members, dominates government, dominates the media, dominates the corporate world, dominates the foundations. And in 1973, a bunch of members of the Council on Foreign Relations formed the Trilateral Commission. And the purpose of the Trilateral Commission was to bring us into world government via the economic route, while the Council on Foreign Relations dwelled mostly in the political arena. And the Trilateral Commission can claim Mr. Clinton, as can the Council on Foreign Relations. I mentioned the Rhodes Scholar Program and this Professor Carol Quigley. Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, published in 1966 while Bill Clinton was a student at Georgetown University. Look at the size of that book. Do you think he had his students read some of it? Or all of it? And why did Bill Clinton praise this man when he accepted the nomination? Well, Mr. Quigley, Professor Quigley, wrote in here about the existence of a secret society. He called it a network. He called it a secret society. He called it an association. And he praised it. He thought it was wonderful. What was its goal? He tells us here on page 324, nothing less 
than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Wow. That was the goal of the secret society. Let me read that again. Nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In other words, world government. That was the goal. Carol Quigley told us about John Ruskin at Oxford University who took the university by storm and one of his most important pupils was a man named Cecil Rhodes who later became fabulously wealthy exploiting the diamond and gold mines in southern Africa. They even named a country after him, didn't they? Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, however. And he talked along here about the association that was formed and it, and it had an inner circle and an outer circle and, the, and the, uh, they finally formed uh, groups that would be identified. They formed the Royal Institute for International Affairs in England and the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States. And they were constantly harping on the lessons to be learned from the failure of the American Revolution. The failure of the American Revolution. Isn't that interesting? Do you think the American Revolution was a failure? If you do, you'd still want to speak with a British accent. Somebody asked me about that one time and said, if you had a chance to speak to the Queen of England, what would you say? I'd say, it's terrible what you people have done to our language. Whoa. <laughs> I had that chance, and maybe it's just as well. The purpose of the secret society was to build world government. Now, Carol Quigley thought it was wonderful, and he later said that in his book. He said, I don't condemn this. My only condemnation is that it wishes to remain secret, and I think it's so wonderful it ought to be well known. And so he wrote this book, and this book became something the John Birch Society has used again and again. And then he wrote another book called The Anglo-American Establishment. And in that book, he said that the Rhodes Scholar Program was simply a vehicle for the secret society. So here we have Bill Clinton as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a member of the Trilateral Commission, and he's a Rhodes Scholar, as are several other prominent individuals, including Chief, uh, one of the justices of the Supreme Court, David Souter. There's about six United States senators and several other cabinet officers. Now the new Deputy Secretary of State has just been appointed, Mr. Strobe Talbot, who was Bill Clinton's roommate at the Rhodes Program. I mentioned the Bilderbergers, and you're probably saying to yourself, what's that, a sandwich? <laughs> no, no, the Bilderbergers isn't a sandwich. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations was David Rockefeller. And David Rockefeller organized the Trilateral Commission with Zbigniew Brzezinski. And in 1954, David Rockefeller organized a meeting of prominent Western Europeans and North Americans and they would have an annual meeting at a very secret location where they'd take over the place and they'd, they'd bar anybody from entering even the hotel while they were there. The first of the meetings they had was at the Bilderberg Hotel in a place called Oosterbeek in the Holland, in Netherlands. He was co-chairing that with Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. And every year since, with one exception, the Bilderbergers have invited prominent Americans to go and to exchange world views. And prominent Americans, including future and past presidents of our country, cabinet officials and so forth, go and they hobnob with the leaders of Western European nations, some uh, Asians, some uh, Latin Americans, and so forth. And we find out that in 1972, David Rockefeller and Brzezinski went to the Bilderberger meeting to present their ideas for the Trilateral Commission, and they thought it was wonderful and said, please, go right ahead and do it. So they came back and formed the Trilateral Commission with a lot of their Bilderberger friends from, from Europe. And we dare call it a conspiracy. Clinton has all four credentials. Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Rhodes Scholar, Bilderberger, there are very few people in the history of our country who could say they had all four credentials. And what is it that they're after? They're after starting the new world order. What is the new world order? George Bush used the phrase, but he never told us what it was. 